Welcome to Wizards of the Tower. Roleplay. And in this episode... The Game Wizards slay the dragon in the Empire of Imagination with the Dice of Men. Welcome to Wizards of the Tower. Roleplay. And in this episode, we're going to be doing a review of some books and a documentary that came out in 2019 that we just watched last night. Well, it's really about people's favorite subject when they talk about role-playing games, and that's the formation of D&D and where it went and what happened to it and what it's doing today. Right, which so. is kind of a, uh, a whole thing with uh, the whole OGL debacle and yeah. things that are going on there, and how it seems that history kind of repeats itself in many ways. Uh, but we really wanted to get at the roots of where the idea of the role-playing game came from. And, you know, a lot of us who play, especially myself, I consider myself more of a role-player than a rules lawyer or a tactician. Uh, I play the game because I like the social interaction, and I like right. the role-playing. I would role play a lot more sometimes if some of the people in our group didn't have a bunch of sticks up their butts. But <laughs> the thing is, is I really do like role playing. So yeah. uh, we started to talk about it, Blaine and I, and we were talking about the origins of D and D. And you had mentioned last night that even when you were f first playing the first set box set, that there were still uh, ideas that Gary Gygax had royally screwed over. Dave, uh, Arneson. Dave Arneson yeah, for yeah. the rights to the game. So. Yeah, that's things that we heard back in you know '79 when I started to play, that's and how Dave ago. had been you know basically stripped of yeah. of his name out of the books mm -hmm. and everything else. You know, maybe a slight mention here or there, but yeah, yeah we had heard that all the way back then at how he how he'd been screwed over and how he was really one of the true founders of the game. And, yeah, and it's such a sad story because. You know, he was a he was a bright young man who did a lot, and you know he had his his issues just like sure. Doug X did. But sure, you know he he really did help develop this game, and unfortunately, uh, you know it's it's only in passing. Everyone talks Guy Gax. Yeah, and you know? the thing is, is I remember when Guy X died, and they had and little and like a radio report about him, and they said that he was the founder and creator of Dungeons and Dragons. They never even mentioned Dave Arneson. Yeah. And I think in a sense, we've got to kind of come back to the belief that, you know, nothing exists in a vacuum. Things come from everywhere. Organically, they grow. And where did the concepts come from? Yeah. So so we're going to start off our first uh, book here, The Empire of Imagination by Michael uh, Whitmer. 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 Yeah. We picked Same that up a few years back and read it. And um, at the time when I read it, I, I, I didn't know enough about the storyline to really understand more so what was what might have happened. And this book is really more of a Gary Gygax worship book. Yeah. it's That's the first thing. I, st I actually just read this here a couple of months ago. Tom had read it a couple of years ago. Yeah. And he saw it and thought, well, I want to read this. And when I... I decided, well, after finishing reading a bunch of stuff that I had on my list to read, I picked it up, and the first thing I said is, wow, this is really heavy in the Gary worship. This is yeah. really, this guy really loves Gary. Yeah. Well, I mean, look and at it's the... A, it's a great story, though. But it is, but look at the cover. Okay, the cover has, like, this D&D-esque kind of it's, illustration. It reminds me a lot of the you know, Unearthed Arcana book. Yeah, you know, here he is, here's Gary, sitting at his his typewriter late into the night with the skull and his little gaming accoutrements right. and there he is typing all by himself and this book gives you the impression that he labored long and hard to come up with all these concepts himself which if you know anything about Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson, TSR you know that essentially a lot of the ideas came from a lot of different people. Yeah. Good book. Uh, it's it's light on the specs, but it does. It, it is a highly recommended book. If it's you a want good to know, story. If you really want to know yeah. about the start of D anD D, but yeah. don't take this as gospel. This has got just the pieces, and yeah. 
more towards the side of Gary than yeah. it does anything else. And how Gary was was shafted and kind of kind of a story how he was booted out and how you know he he was wronged and everything else yeah. so but it's a good book it is it's, it's just a little slanted towards him yeah. so if you want to get the whole story there's you know other stories out there in other books but this is a this is a good place to start but just keep it in yeah. mind and it's a really easy read but just keep in mind that it's a little slanted toward his point of view yeah. and not the other points of view so 254 pages yeah it's um, a very fast read very very well written uh, it'll go fast um, you know, it's enjoyable. Yep. It's got a very romantic kind of edge to it. It's got some old photos in it, which are kind of yeah. fun to see, and and how Lorraine did him wrong, and and the Blooms did him wrong, and yeah. But it's like I said, it's very slanted towards the Gary Gary side of it. But yeah, highly recommend it if you really sure. want to know the history. Sure. And it's it's a quick read. Yeah. So I'll pass that one over off on to you. The next book in our series is Game Wizards, The Epic Battle for Dungeons and Dragons by John Peterson. Well, that was a, that was a tome. That was hard to get through. But it is so informative. Uh, I would say I would put this into more of the anti-Gary camp. Yeah. yeah. Um, not necessarily pro Arneson, but definitely a little more anti-Gary, definitely anti-Lorraine. However, you do learn a few things about Lorraine Williams that essentially she wasn't, didn't seem to be a bad person outside of business. Uh, within business, she was just so focused on maintaining her own profile, that's where everything yeah. kind of went wrong. She just did not understand the gaming business at all. Right. And that's what kind of drove the gaming business business into the dirt. And this one doesn't hit a lot upon Lorraine, but it does hit a little bit upon Lorraine. Yeah, I mean, it's not a Lorraine, Lorraine Williams no. biography, obviously, but it, it does talk, it talks a lot about the business financial ends. And oh, what, heavily on the financial ends. Yeah. The money, how much money was made, yeah. how much money was spent, where it went, what happened. And, and, you know, how, uh, how TSR bought a needlepoint company, which yeah. was because of the blooms. Yeah, it's almost a it's also it's almost a financial forensics book, but it is very easy to read and very and, and uh, very well done, very very well written and researched. Uh, I learned a lot about the storyline from this book. Um, you know, the guy, man, he's done his research yeah. more so than anything else. And the author is actually a history of gaming author. That's what he writes about. He writes yeah. about the history of gaming. So he knows quite a bit about how games are created, how they function, how they come about, what they do, etc. So uh, for a way more in-depth storyline that is a little long, a little dry, but nonetheless very uh, informative, I would recommend this book. Yeah, and it's, it's good. There was a couple pages I, I dog-eared in here because they were very interesting. Um, you should never dog-ear pages. <laughs> Tom doesn't like that. That's damaging a book in his view, and he's right. I typically don't do that, but yeah, there's there's some really good good things in here that I really like, and it at the end of each chapter it talks about the revenue that's made and how yeah. many employees they have, their yeah. stock value, how their stock goes up and down, and how you know Lorraine. It, it does hit upon how Lorraine underhandedly took the company from. Gygax, which she, they talk a little bit about in Empire of Imagination yeah. as well. Yeah. How she, how the Blooms, they were forcing the Blooms out because of bad decisions and Blooms doing their nepotism with hiring tons of family, which yeah. were ruining the company. Yeah. And, um, how they, uh, how the Blooms had all this, the share, the controlling interest in the company. Yeah. And, Gygax didn't want to pay what they wanted for him. He thought it was overvalued, and Lorraine went to him under underhandedly and bought all the shares to control gain the interest. Yeah. And she did it in a very, very sneaky. Actually, it would be considered illegal how it was done, but it was done and it held up. Yeah, I mean, you you begin to realize you know, how focused uh, Lorraine Williams was mm -hmm. into getting control of the company. Um, I don't know exactly why she wanted control of the company, except maybe 
you know, at the time, she owned the the copyright rights to uh, Buck Rogers. Buck Rogers. And she wanted to make sure that Buck Rogers material was published through TSR's publishing house. Right. So she wanted to make sure that the Buck Rogers profile, and I think because she was a family member of the guy yeah. who created Buck Dill, Rogers. The Dills. And then her yeah. father was heavily into the, the comic scene. That's right. G.I. Joe and, yeah. and yeah. a bunch of other stuff. And yeah. he and Gygax actually helped do the, the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon series. That's right. He Yeah, he's the one who, he's the one who had, gave the idea of Hey, my sister's got some money. Uh, why can't she buy into the company and keep it afloat? That kind of thing. Yeah. And it was millions. It was millions of dollars. And she bought into it thinking that, oh, I can use the publishing house that TSR has that publishes all their books mm -hmm. like this and all the really well, you know, really good selling, mm -hmm. uh, best selling um, uh, fiction books that went along with, um, you know, the, the Dungeons and Dragons uh, storyline. You know all the Dragonlance stuff, all mm -hmm. that, and so uh, that she saw that as a way of publishing the Buck Rogers stuff, which when they right. finally did, did not sell a dime. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was I remember it did the Buck not Rogers. work. Um, I remember the Buck Rogers books and yeah. the game and the the computer game yeah. and everything else. Apparently, it just, it just just did not match what people wanted to do with D and D. It's a faded sort of uh, property. You know, it's it's. You know, those of us who saw the TV show Buck Rogers in the 25th century, we liked it. Yeah, you know, fun. when we were kids, it was fun. It was exciting. had nice people in it. But the thing is, is the storyline was already pretty aged by then, and it was really yeah. aged, you know, later. Right, because Buck Rogers, if you remember, it comes, comes from the 30s. Yeah. Actually, I think even further back with, with radio. And I mean, that might TV. even be in the 20s. I mean, yeah. Man, it's way back. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, th this author charts the rise and fall of of the the game in like that and it ends basically when Lorraine sells it to Wizards of the Coast sells the company to Wizards of the Coast. It doesn't this one doesn't get heavily into the Lorraine though. No. It's just a little bit of it. I yeah. finished this book just the other day. Yeah. And uh, I enjoyed it. So one thing you have to it, This one ends I think in, in 85. Yeah. Right right when uh, Gygax is is getting the boot. Yeah. So you, what you have to understand about is um, this book deals a lot more with the actual origins of uh, the role-playing game setup. Uh, late 60s, early 70s, you know, the, the Minnesota Twin Cities battle group that they had formed and all that sort of stuff, the Gen mm -hmm. Cons, all that. And so if you want a really good history... And yeah, the game, yeah, game conventions, because yeah. Gen Con and Origins. Origins yeah. was big. Yeah. I remember the Origins and how Gygax basically drove Origins into the dirt. Well, it even it mm -hmm. talks all about that in here. Yeah. Uh, if you're sort of obsessed with what happened to the other gaming conventions besides Gen Con, this book will tell you about it. Right. And and how he shafted Dave Arneson and how he shafted other other people. There's, there's part of this book that when... Uh, Gygax and Arneson were working together with Get Iron Games. How Gygax was taking Arneson's royalties. Yeah. And Arneson was saying, Well, where's my royalties? I haven't seen any. And Gygax, Oh, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. And actually, he had taken them instead of paying them out yeah. to Arneson. He pocketed it. Yeah. So Gary was not the nice guy. Yeah. Now, the other thing this really hits upon is Gary Gygax was Jehovah Witness and how he almost quit so many times. How he how he got out of gaming and yeah and you can really see you know Gygax didn't have a whole lot he he worked but he he got so much in the games that he lost his job and yeah. and he had this huge family and and had no money and so he thought well you know I'm making money and I'm going to keep it because I need it more than than Arneson because Arneson's you know living with his parents he doesn't yeah. need it yeah. So you really kind of see the the dark side of Gary Gygax in this. Yeah, and the, he's not such the great guy that everyone imagined him to be. Yeah, and this book does not mince details in that. So no, you really come through this thinking that, wow, uh, you know, he might have been a really nice guy to know and to to game with and have fun with. But as a business, but man, I wouldn't want to engage in a business relationship with that guy. I mean, you'd end up, <laughs> he'd, he'd walk with a briefcase full of money, and you'd get a kick in the butt right out the door. And they talk in here about all the mass hirings and firings at TSR yeah. during, the, during the 80s, and ah, oh, man, anybody who's ever been fired from a job or had to quit a yeah. job, it hits hard. 
Yeah, oh. and then the shafting of, of people, oh, you know, yeah. that, that uh, you know, you promise them, you promise them uh, royalties, and then you yeah. decide, well, no, we're not going to give you royalties anymore, but I'm going to keep my royalties. Stealing the intellectual property of the people who worked yeah. for you, which, it, uh, as an artist myself, I can tell you is a very, very, very sore subject. Yeah. And if you get upset by sore subjects, especially when it comes to intellectual property, intellectual property... Be be careful because this book is going to touch a lot of nerves. Yeah, yeah, and you know it's funny because you know when Gygax was taking taking things from uh, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter Mars, and Tolkien. Yeah, you know, and, and using them and not without paying royalties. Yeah, and then how he was so happy to anybody who who did anything against him, and yep. now you've got Wizards of the Coast doing the exact same yeah. thing. Yeah, and it's Wizards of the Coast Hasbro. It's not so much. It's not so much the original Wizards of the Coast, Hasbro. It's it's the Hasbro side and how they're they're back to the same old antics of, hey, let's sue anybody who's using any anything that's ours. But yet, they did it time and time and time and time again and got away with it yeah. for a long time. I think a lot of times it the, the book is really critical of what you'd consider to be your typical corporate operations, yeah. which is basically gain control of everything you can. Let go of nothing, boost your profile, sell at a profit, kick everybody to the curb, walk away to the bank laughing. Right, and how how people who had no no really rights to run a business made yeah. billions of dollars. Well, not billions, millions. Well, it probably added up to billions. Maybe by in, now, in, in in the end, but yeah. and then ruined the company. Yeah, drove, drove it into, into the, the dirt. Ground. So yeah. Anyway, game wizards. Yeah, Good by uh, John Peterson, who is a uh, game historian. This one's a, a more recent book, Slaying the Dragon, A Secret History of Dungeons and Dragons by Ben Riggs. Now, this book actually is more the Lorraine Williams side of it. Yeah, it uh, it comes into the story a little later. So, yeah. you, you know, if you want to like look at them sort of sequentially, you know, you've got the Gary story, which is kind of all Gary, and then you've got this with the beginning days, and then you've got this with sort of the end days. Right. So, kind of how This is very, out. very Lorraine Williams side of it, and how they were bringing yeah. in all these artists and yeah. and the publishing of stories. You know, the the Forgotten Realms and Green, Ed Greenwood, and how Ed Greenwood they they basically gave him nothing for yeah. the Forgotten Realms. How that poor guy got the shaft, and he stayed. I, yeah. He has stayed with with Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro. Yeah. Um, I couldn't believe how people. I mean, I guess it's you know, it's really hard to make it as an artist. It truly is. Yeah. And writers don't get a lot of money. You know, they don't make a lot of money. Very few people are the Anne Rices and the Stephen Kings of the world. Most people just toil in obscurity, right. and they don't make a lot of money. Not barely break even. So they do it because they've got the creative impulse. And what TSR was really good. At doing is exploiting people's creative creative impulse for their own profit, right. keeping people in sort of like this wage slavery, uh, and exploiting their creativity for the pure profit of the CEOs who run yeah. the company. You know, and it, it's it happens to just about everybody who works for big companies who are creative, uh, but you really you really feel it for the people who got shafted. Right. Some of our favorite authors. Well, you know? Hickman and Weiss and yeah. how they got shafted. And, oh man. And in the artists, the Elmore art, the, Parkinson, yeah. the illustrators, Caldwell, got, yeah, Brom, oh. who who you know painted these fantastic arcs, and it was a great start for them. Yeah. It was it was really a launching pad for their careers. Yeah. But TSR took control of all the work that they made. Their work was not their own. Everything they yeah. did belonged to TSR. So everything, the, yeah, everything. So the whole idea is, well, you painted it here at the at the studio using our using paints. our paint and our canvas, so it belongs completely to us. Which, okay, there's a point for that. However, I think people they took advantage of people who really needed jobs, creative people mm -hmm. who really needed jobs, made them sign contracts that were very exploitive, and then they then exploited them. Yeah. You know. So in my opinion, I think maybe some of these artists should have taken a closer look. And some of these contracts before they signed them. On the other hand, when you're a starving artist, you'll do anything to make money, just yeah. like anybody will. Yeah. And it's it's this book ends when Wizards of the Coast actually buys yeah. TSR. Yeah. TSR was thirty million dollars in debt, and what the, the sad thing was is they had worked this huge contract out with Walden Books selling their product, 
and they would make all this product and they would ship it off to Walden Books and Walden Books would pay them before the product actually sold. Yeah. And they ended up having some games that just flopped. Yeah. That uh, that they ended up having to buy back. Yeah. Walden Books Walden sent Books. them back because they didn't sell. Yeah, and they had warehouse just clear full of, yeah. of product that just wasn't selling. Yeah. And, and it was, was these specific games towards the end of the TSR. Yeah. Uh, which I don't know much about, but there was these modules and these and these board games board and stuff games, yeah. that people said essentially were just incomprehensible and difficult to play, and you know you just didn't you didn't, <laughs> didn't like them. There was the one that was the videotape. Oh it yeah, was taught, teaching the kids, and it was really questionable. That wow, should should really eight, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve year old kids be watching this because yeah. it was pretty brutal and yeah and. And gory, you know, very adult orientated, more towards the 17, 18, 19 yeah. on up crowd, and it was it was pretty well done, but it just wasn't selling. Yeah. So they owed all this money, and it just it bit into them, and owing thirty million dollars at the at the end. Now Lorraine hated Wizards of the Coast. Mm -hmm. She she thought Magic the Gathering was a blight to gaming and everything yeah. about gaming. Even though Lorraine was not a gamer herself, herself, I yeah. don't even know if she ever played a game. But she hated Wizards of the Coast, and so here's the, the owner of Legend of the Five Rings, who said yeah. uh, who made a deal of, of uh, hey, uh, I'll buy TSR from you, and yeah. then he went behind her back, yeah. and worked a deal with Wizards of the Coast to buy Legend of the Five Rings, yeah, along with TSR, <laughs> along with TSR, and she found that she wasn't happy, but she you know, signed. He. he uh, he convinced her yeah. to uh, to sign yeah. the, the she deal. Signed, and, she signed it. And uh, uh, sold it and walked away with, with money in her pocket. Yeah. Essentially tricked her into signing a prospectus that she would indeed buy Legend of the Five Rings. Yeah. However, the, no, the, uh, she that, would sell that she would, sorry, that she would sell to Legend of the Five Rings, not really realizing that on the contract, Legend of the Five Rings and Wizards of the Coast was combined into this entity at the time right. to buy it. Because as this author says over and over again, had she known that Wizards of the Coast wanted to buy TSR, she would never have sold. Right. She would have driven that company so far into bankruptcy, uh, it would never have emerged from anything. And that's what people were worried about. They were worried that TSR was going to go into bankruptcy, that bankruptcy courts would grab all the intellectual and properties yes. and basically break it all up into nothing. Right, right. You know, break it up into a hundred different entities that no one would ever be able to deal with. Now, kind of an interesting thing is Lisa Stevens, who is the the uh, owner of Paizo, actually had developed a game called Ars Magica, and she had gone to work for Wizards of the Coast, so she actually had some RPG background in her, and that was the whole thing, you know, with it and kind of convincing. Yeah. So, you know, Lisa Stevens was kind of right there in the middle of, of getting in on the, the whole TSR thing, and mm -hmm. she'd been running games for a long time. Yeah. But this is this is a good book. This yeah. one's quick and easy to read. Yeah. Um, much more on the Lorraine Williams side. It, it does get into a little bit about Gary and and Gary's <laughs> Gary's Hollywood Playboy Mansion coke filled debauch there's debauchery. A, there's a few um, <laughs> really sad anecdotes in here, which we're not going to talk no. about right now. If you read this book, be prepared to cry a little bit when you realize how much was wasted and lost yeah. when TSR went under. Be prepared because... Oh, yeah. Oh, there was a warehouse. No, no, no. Oh, no. Yeah. Don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't bring Don't that... Spoiler. Don't yeah, spoiler. that's a spoiler because mm. if you read this book, be prepared to cry. The uh, loss of, of yeah, stuff. Anybody who loves any of this right here um, and has worked for hours painting things to make them look perfect and great for the game... Uh, when you read about what happened with a lot of their merchandise, it will break your heart. Yep. Yep. Good book. The last book of Dice and Men, The Story of Dungeons and Dragons and the People Who Play It by David Ewalt. So I haven't read this book, so you're going to have to just talk yeah. about it. So of Dice and Men is actually more about the game. And the interesting thing is... Um, David is actually the only one to actually get to interview Lorraine Williams. Right, everyone yeah. else, I have everyone else, uh, she denied. Yeah, I have heard that. Yeah, but this is a good book. It talks, you know, it talks about those of us who play the game and why we play the game, and and about characters. And so this one's more about the game of Dungeons and Dragons and RPGs and than anything else. 
but I would recommend this book. It's quick, it's easy to read, it's fun, not so much history, a little bit of history, but still a good read to have. To me, it seems like it takes more of a neutral stand. It does. It's a very neutral. Yeah. That and is. it's more about those of us who play yeah. RPGs and Dungeons and Dragons or yeah. Pathfinder or, or any other RPG. Yeah, what is the attraction of role-playing right. games as opposed to the formation and the politics and the right. business side? It's more about the attraction and why, why it worked out. Yeah. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, and I think this is kind of important about this book. It talks a lot about the Satanic Panic. Yes. And it talks a lot about uh, monsters and mazes or whatever. Mazes and monsters by Roger Jaffe. Yeah, mazes and monsters. It talks a lot about that. And Egbert. And what it is, is it basically debunks that entire storyline. And you realize the shaft that the whole concept of role-playing games, D&D, &D, everything, the shaft that they got from the news media. You know, and it's funny because Satanic Panic, because we were there in the depths of it yeah. in, the, in the 80s and 90s yeah. with, with Dungeons and Dragons and heavy metal. Yep. And, yep. and now we've got the Satanic Panic with the LGBT. I you know IQ community and yeah. it's the same thing same over thing. and over and some again. of the same people believe yeah. it or not yeah. yeah but it's the same thing it's like and, history and repeats politics itself and over and over again you know politicians they always seek to divide they never seek to unite just remember that and that's all politicians yeah it's not it's not just one yeah. side or the other yeah. it's all of them it's all of them or religion and yeah but yeah I recommend this book if you want to know more about the game and, and the fun of the game he kind of has some some anecdotes about his adventures and and the campaign he played that was kind of a vampire campaign in uh, in San Francisco North America and kind of interesting it's like yep. okay that's a little bit different but um, I would recommend this book not as not about so much the develop the, the, the growth of the game yeah and the designing of the game but more about the game yeah Last thing we're going to hit upon is something we watched last night mm -hmm. on Amazon. We rented it for three ninety nine. dollars The Secrets of Blackmore. Um, a really in-depth, very detailed documentary about really where the origins of the D&D &D role-playing game sort of concept yeah. came from. And RPGs in general. And RPGs in general, yes. A lot of times people will say, you know, Dungeons & Dragons was the first RPG. And actually, that is not true. That's not true. That is so far from the truth. Um, well, it, you know, it grows out of it. It like, grows out. Like, like a tree from the roots. Right. Um, but what we found out, and you've got to stick with pretty much the entire documentary to find this out, that you talk, it talks about Blackmore, the game that, uh, they Arneson. Still, that yeah. Arneson created that they still play today. All the original Blackmore people get together yeah. and play it. Those who are alive, yeah. Yeah, and, and it, they're all in their 70s and 80s and whatever, and they still play. And, of course, you know, Arneson's passed well, away. Well, Arneson's daughter. But Arneson's Familiar. daughter's involved in there. Uh, but really what it does, what it talks about is where did the idea of the role-playing game concept come from? And what you find out is it really comes from a guy named Dave Wesley who created a game called Brownstein. And Brownstein was an interactive role-playing game scenario mm -hmm. created by him in the late 60s. It's basically based upon their wargaming of Napoleonics. Yeah. And how he would assign leadership roles all the way from, from the, the leaders of the country and in breaking it down that you would also play a general and then you would also play townies. Yeah. And it wasn't just Napoleonics. Napoleonics was the first, and how yeah. he would sit in another room, and and people would come in and talk to him, and and tell him what they were going to do. So they had a fog of war. Yeah. And then they would go out, and they were actually talking behind the back, mm -hmm. and it was really interesting. And, yeah. And how Arneson. Uh, Arneson was involved as it, just yeah. a teenager in in this, and how he really took it. He really took the idea. Now, they had Brownstein 1, which was like a European style, and they had Brownstein 2. But when it came about to another one that that they ran, another Brownstein game, they ran in Central America. And it was a current spy, kind of a Banana Republic spy story. And uh, Dave Arneson showed up with all this kind of 
uh, these prop, documents, these props, cross documents. like these fake documents, like showing that he was a CIA agent or he was a millionaire, and so he inhabited this kind of persona yeah. to fool everybody in the game and turn all the other players against each other, so that he could he could come out on top. Now, it's very important to understand that in a role playing game, there are no winners and losers. Okay, you don't win a role playing game; you keep playing it again right. and again and again. Now, you'll have successes in it, and you'll have failures in it, but you don't come out on top. This isn't like football, where one team wins. You just keep going in a role-playing game, and that's a very important concept, because even then, when you play the Napoleonics, or you play Risk, or you play Battlefield, or you play D-Day, whatever, there's always winners and losers. Right. But in a role-playing game, and this came out when we talk about Brownstein, there are no winners and losers. There's just the game itself that keeps going and evolving. Right. Kind of the interesting thing with, with that South American one was when Arneson had all this fake infra, uh, props, they all had primary, secondary, third, and fourth goals. And one of his goals was to distribute leaflets throughout the town about people. And at the very end, they're thinking at the end that, okay, he failed on his objective. But he actually succeeded in his objective yeah. as as the game was ending. Yep. He's flying away in a helicopter throwing out the leaflets exactly. all over the town. So he did make he did succeed in his goals. But the the story doesn't really focus around winning and losing. It no. focuses around just an event that took place. Right. Succeeding in your goals. Yeah. So from that, Arneson decided that in the in one of the Brownstein games, they were gonna bring in a castle. And the castle was gonna have a labyrinth underneath it. Now the thing is, when we talk about dungeons, okay, a dungeon is essentially just a jail. Right. All right. In the bottom of the tower, there's a few rooms, and they call it dungeon. It's essentially just a jail. But what we're talking more in D&D about when you talk about dungeons is a labyrinth. And right. that comes from the old Greek myth of the labyrinth, the minotaur, right. everything. You know, it's this endless underground, and it's supposed to be hell, if you want to look at it that way. It's supposed to be Hades, the underworld. It's this elaborate tunnel system that goes forever and ever and ever and is filled with all kind of monsters, mazes, loot, stories, you know, information. Mm -hmm. That's what they talk about when they talk about a dungeon. It's really just a labyrinth. So underneath the Brownstein castle, underneath the Blackmore Castle in Brownstein, there was a labyrinth. And people started playing in that. It was this multi-layered right. labyrinth. Now, now, take in mind, this is 1971. Yeah. The Ornison yep. came up with this. That's a that's quite a few years before Gygax yeah. and Arneson really yeah. started working together. Exactly, and all these rules and stuff that he came up with in designing this this dungeon, yeah. this this castle, and the layers beneath of it, and what happened, and and storming, and what these people did holding the ball rod because yeah. uh, to save party members, and there was yeah. a, a guy that got turned into a vampire who became the vampire. Yeah. There was the first wizard and the first paladin, and then they talked to uh, the first female RPG player who actually was playing in yeah. Blackmore. In Blackmore. Yeah, these are the original characters who created the classes that we know today. Paladin, cleric. fighter, cleric, wizard. rogue, wizard. Uh, they, they came up with that when they played Blackmore. And this is before D&D now. Right. The first interactions, okay, that Arneson had with Gygax was at Gygax's military gaming convention that had no role-playing in it. Gen Con. Gen Con. Gen Con. It was military role-playing, and that was in the early 70s, like 72 or 73. And they met, and they started talking about what they, what they a gaming system for, for, midi, for um, Napoleonic air ships called Don't Give Up the Ship, D-Guts. And D-Guts, of course, had morale, and it had uh, all kind of attributes in it. And a lot of that got taken and lifted out of there and put into D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. The attributes, the idea of morale, the idea of, you know, your players being sick, of being scared, and, and you know, of being, you know, different conditions for them. So that got lifted the economics in. And yeah, the economics of, of, of operating ships and, and operating armies and cities. So a lot of that got lifted into D&D, &D, you know, through that. But it, it didn't actually start from, you know, other gaming systems. It, a lot of it came from Blackmore. Yeah, and then, and then the development of Chainmail, yeah. which, you know, Arneson had rights in. And, and it's kind of interesting, even in the first books of D&D, &D, there's, there's quotes by Gygax about how the game could not have happened without Arneson 
But as you start reading the books, how Gygax yeah. kicked Arneson completely out of it yeah. and, and said, oh, he had nothing to do with it. Yeah. But, but Arneson's uh, lawsuits against TSR prove that, yeah. that he was right, and yeah. he got basically nothing for you know, see, compared. But Yeah, see, Gary wrote this editorial in Dungeon Magazine, and he said... Dragon Magazine. Dragon Magazine, and he said, look, essentially all I ever got from Dave Arneson was 20 haphazardly typescripted pages of his basic ideas and I took a lot of those ideas and I, I edited them and I, I polished them up and from that came D&D. And what's funny is the first female role player actually remembers. She shows the typewriter yeah. and says, I remember typing all of this out. Yeah. And of course a lot of that yeah. came out in the legal issues and legal yeah. cases where the judge ruled and Arneson was always fond of telling people this that he co-created that game. And there's nothing Gary Gygax could do about it because he was ruled that he co-created it and Gary owned owed him royalties. Yeah. Now, that didn't keep Gary from, like, chiseling him over his royalties. Mm -hmm. Time and time and time, time and again. time again. However, that uh, essentially what happened is that, the, you know, he had the rule and the court rulings to back him up. Now, we don't want to really bandy it back and forth about the court stuff, okay? No. But what we wanted everybody to understand is when it comes to the role-playing game itself, they were created by people who wanted to inhabit characters, who wanted to add life, who wanted to add right. excitement and, and multi-dimensional... Uh, Bring a totally different aspect. Yeah, they wanted to add multi-dimensional aspects to their characters within wargaming. It wasn't just wargaming, rolling the dice, moving people around. They wanted to have the mm -hmm. general consider doing something different, or they wanted to have the privates doing something. So they wanted to create characters within the storyline. And that's that's the that's the main focus of role playing is that you take on a character, you play that role, and that's why role playing mm -hmm. games are so popular, or they were so popular. Now they're becoming a little less popular because everybody's got their face planted in their phone. But really, up until that point, people like to act, they like to role play, they like to sing, like to dance, they like to do all sorts of things, they like to be creative, and that's where role playing games really took off. Yeah. So it's really interesting reading the four books and then watching the uh, the, the first real documentary on RPGs, The yeah. Secrets of Blackmore. It's interesting that Arneson's side was actually told before Gygax's side. Now, I know there was a Kickstarter done that is still being worked on for a documentary about Gygax and Dungeons and & Dragons and how it's been going through lawsuits after lawsuits and I know just recently it was pretty much announced that Joe Manganiello was working on one yeah. for the 50th anniversary yeah. for Dungeons and Dragons and it'll be really interesting to see how much they hit upon Arneson in, in those. Now one of the real interesting things in the uh, Slaying the Dragon when Wizards of the Coast bought TSR they actually went back and paid Arneson and Gygax an equal share of money that yeah. wasn't much to buy them off to buy their intellectual property, right? Because they made a judgment at the time, you know, to be to be completely fair, they made a judgment at the time that these guys were owed because of their intellectual property, right? Which which is a very very fair thing to do. So I get the idea that the guy who bought the guy from Wizards of the Coast who bought TSR was a real stand up guy, yeah. And what he wanted to do essentially was to be fair to everybody who was involved in the whole intellectual property, you know, creation of the TSR and now he also paid out to the to various artists and authors mm -hmm. who worked for TSR at the time um, he paid them out too he bought he bought their contracts out and paid them the money they owed many of them said that it was the first time in months that they had that they had gotten paid yeah, because royalties royalties and not only that but just got a paycheck because TSR had not been paying people no, they actually defaulted on paying, yeah. paying employees. So it was pretty. It was pretty bad. Yeah. But if there's one thing that you can take away from what we're trying to do with this, is that really the concept of the role playing idea came from Dave Wesley and Brownstein, and then it was modified through that interaction. It grew with Dave Arneson into Blackmore. Right, and then Arneson went to Gygax, and they yeah. bloomed it out even yeah. more. Yeah, before Greyhawk, there was Blackmore. Okay, keep that in mind. Blackmore was this elaborate land that Arneson drew out on the huge piece of paper. You know, mountains, rivers, streams, forest, bridges, swamps. forests, and where everybody was from. You had the wizard of the forest, you had the troll and the bridge, you had mm -hmm. all these people, you had the villages, 
and that and that's how the whole thing was constructed and it worked out with the whole you know just like the maps that we use today that's how it was all constructed and those are the beginning concepts of the role-playing game and where it came from right so um, with that i think we're going to end this episode this long episode but very informative i think yeah. about the history of rpgs but yeah. um thanks for watching for wizards of the tower role play and may all your adventures be epic and keep on rolling don't forget to like share and subscribe